Hello and welcome to the Framework in Focus, a video cast series where we provide insight into the ebook, which goes by the title of Musculoskeletal Clinical Translation Framework from Knowing to Doing, Darren. That, that sounds like a mouthful, Tim. So um, here on two fourth, we will refer to it just as the framework. Um, so we hope this series will complement the ebook and provide additional insights into the whys, whens, wheres and hows of the framework. And this, uh, well our aim here is to facilitate knowledge translation uh, in the management of musculoskeletal pain and it's a little ongoing kind of uh, focus for us. Yeah. All right, good. So what are we up to? Number eight, which is the work considerations. Um, probably part of um, lifestyle, but work is such a big uh, focus on its own. We, 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 you know, this was an update to add this into the framework, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we had it under lifestyle mm. factors initially, but when you look at it, for a, a lot of us, a whole lot of our life is spent at work. Yes. <laughs> so it's often a very important part of a person's story or, and what may be contributing to their musculoskeletal pain. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, so this is our warning slide and, and we're talking about the individual elements of the framework today work, but, but we just want to um, reinforce that all these um, elements are interconnected and while you have to talk about them in isolation, that's a bit false and yep. in terms of uh, dealing with the person, you're considering all of them. Yep. <laughs> all right, so our quote for the day from the American poet, Maya Angelou. Nothing will work unless you do. You know what? It's a good one. Oh, one of my favourite American poets, Darren, and a great quote there. Oh, good, good. All right, so this is the, the cutout from the framework uh, ebook, and uh, really just alluding to the terminology that some people might be aware of of blue flags and black flags. Yeah. Uh, and um, I guess we were just chatting around the, the blue flags probably being kind of internal yeah. within the worker and the, and the black fur flags maybe more external. Yeah, so we think about that in other areas of musculoskeletal pain, we talk about intrinsic factors. Mm. So as you say, internal to the person, which we'll cover off on a list of those, but mm. they might be their, their satisfaction, how they view work, their workplace relationships kind of things. Mm. And the external or the black flags is more the, the work itself, so the nature of the work or the work environment, that's mm. what we talk about in workplace ergonomics for example, that more comes under uh, that area. Yeah. And one or both of those may be major factors contributing to some people's musculoskeletal pain. Yeah. And um, good to think of the mantra that good work is good for your health. Yeah. And um, you know, it's so inherent in, in work yeah. itself, um, both in terms of just, you know, for, for people in general, but then, then more focused when someone has an injury. <laughs> yeah, well, it was interesting that someone that we worked with from an insurance company a number of years ago came up with the, um, the data around that long-term worklessness mm. is bad for your health, and they, there's measured negative health effects of long-term worklessness, and they've equated that to smoking seven packs of cigarettes a day. Yeah, so... Yeah. It kind of seems a bit silly but it's not because our intrinsic um the the positives that we get out of contributing or being you know helpful in in work or other environments that that are central to our being if you like is is really yeah. important if that's taken away then that can be very detrimental and there's measurable health effects around you know cardiovascular effects of that and, yeah. and <laughs> others that can be influenced by this yeah and um, I, I think um, sitting for one hour is the equivalent to smoking one cigarette. So you've already had about three today, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is our list of... Uh... <laughs> Tim doesn't really smoke people. <laughs> um, this is our list of things. It's a, it's a, so we'll just go through these one by one. So number one is job satisfaction. Um, yeah, that can be a big factor in someone wanting to get back to work when they have an injury. Yeah, and a lot of these are listed in known research around predictors of poor recovery, particularly after a workplace injury, and, yeah. and job satisfaction often comes up as number one. And this comes back to that intrinsic worth, if you like, that mm. people place yeah. in work. So if someone doesn't like their job and they're injured, it automatically 
there's, I guess, reduced internal desire and incentive to get back to work compared to someone who loves their job, and we see that all the time, don't we? Where people yeah. say, look, I just want to be back at work. Yeah. You know, I really love being there. I love my work play, workmates, for example, so that satisfaction yeah. side of it is key and in our screening question is that we use we actually ask people to rate their job satisfaction yeah and that alone is a in some instances an important piece of information yeah it is so a simple uh, question you can ask if you, if you don't have it written down um, in anything they fill out you know yeah. are you satisfied with your work uh, workplace culture yeah and that it, it is a bit different from from co-worker support but mm. is there's concepts around um, job autonomy and the amount of responsibility you have is predictive of, of positive chances of returning to work. Um, and just generally an environment, if there's a positive environment that yeah. you're in, you're more likely to want to be back there, basically. Yeah, and the injury management culture is pretty critical. Like, you know, I had a, a chap yesterday who hurt his knee and, um, but he's, he's on the mine site and, you know, they, they wanted him back. Um, you know, the next day kind of thing, and he wasn't feeling up to that, and said his knee was the size of a football, but he was signed, you know, back to work, and, yep. and it didn't work out well for him, so that culture of trying to keep people working was it was negative um, yeah. for him. <laughs> as a healthcare practitioner, we can't necessarily influence that. No. That's really, as employers, and also employees, that's where that workplace culture comes from. Yeah. But our awareness, of that to some degree will be important for some people. Yeah. yeah. And, and even for physios or any health practitioner that goes into the workplace, that can be a real challenge. Mm. Um, yeah. But it is important. And, and yeah, co-worker support, um, particularly um, the direct you know, manager as well, which is probably the second one managed, the point after this management. Yeah. Um, so the, the relationship between a worker and their direct report is um, massively important. <laughs> yeah, there's good research around that. Yeah. We've done some studies, I, know, I can think of one study many years ago where in one workplace, the direct manager and one co-worker were assigned to contact the injured worker once a week to check in with them. Yeah. And that was significantly associated with reduction in time off work because of the injury. And anecdotally, we see that all the time where people come in and they've been off work for a period and they say, look, I haven't heard from my work in months. And if work's an important part of your life, that ain't really helpful in fostering that sort of workplace culture and, and no. satisfaction. No, and it, and it leads to a sense of abandonment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it can be difficult potentially to... Uh, for a healthcare pr practitioner to manage an adversarial relationship between a person who's injured and their employer and direct supervisor but um, certainly you know if you're treating someone's knee and that's getting better and they're not getting back to work because of these other factors you've got to be aware of that yeah. and then um, you know there are suggestions you can make around that in terms of vocational rehab support <laughs> yeah and like you said it's challenging but you don't have to fix all these things no. <laughs> it's like a number of elements of the framework that we talk around you don't have to be an expert in all of these but it is incumbent on you to some degree to have some awareness of this yep. so if you pick up workplace as an issue the most important thing you might do is communicate that to someone else yeah yeah rather than you trying to fix it but yeah. hang on this is a barrier and yep. you know i can think of many examples where we've done that where we've gone look the the management of the condition is on track yeah but as you said there's another barrier there, so that needs to be addressed, but not necessarily by the healthcare practitioner. No, no. Um, we'll drop down to suitable work duties. As you said, good work is good for your health, and yep. I think one of the most common errors we see in these efforts to get people back to work is that they're given light duties that can be either meaningless yep. or demeaning for the person. Yep. They're both ways, either they're too simple and there's, you know, they might be filing bits of paper or pulling out staples, I've heard, is yeah. another yeah. example of that. Or the other way around, someone who's more manually skilled in their job and they might operate machinery that involves some really quite good technical skills and then they're put in an office behind a computer with no computer skills. Yeah. So they're 
obviously not suitable duties. That's from the meaningfulness, if you like, but yeah. there's also suitable duties around the person's capacity. injury capa <laughs> or their, their capacity or their actual injury itself. Mm. So Can the, you think of examples? Well, well when you were talking about sitting, you know, the, the, or the manual worker yeah. who has a sore back, doesn't like sustained positions and um, stuck behind a desk. <laughs> yeah. And the other favourite light duties one I've seen in physical um, workplaces is the uh, sweeping or cleaning of the workshop uh, yes. <laughs> where often people with back pain early on that sort of forward leaning sweeping is one of the best things to stir them up but that's considered yeah. light duties yeah, yeah exactly so how does the health practitioner have a role in that then yeah well got to be very clear on what the person can um, um, cope with yep. what they can do yeah I think it, you know there's a lot of debate around what they can do and pointing out what they can't do and in the UK it's been very successful changing from that they can do this from you know previously being they can't do this yeah. uh, approach so that is important but there is a balance in that I think of what they can and can't do I think um, that the most one of the most important thing for the um, healthcare practitioners to do is to um, the comments on their capacity and not on the availability of um, duties that might relate to that capacity <laughs> yeah yeah and i think we also have an important role of encouraging the worker back to work oh yeah mm -hmm. and as you said focusing on what they can do because mainly all over the world but certainly a lot of research done out of the uk has looked at this and yeah. shown the longer someone stays off work there's this exponential curve yeah. that they're very unlikely and i think if you're off work for more than three months, there's an 80 to 90% likelihood that you'll never return to your pre-injury duties. Yep. So that's why getting people engaged in some form of work yep. is very important. Yep. So and that we can have a role in saying that getting back to doing something will be important as long as it's mm. somewhat meaningful, so good work. And understanding what their work actually entails, like yep. how many physios that we talk to a lot don't actually understand the, the, the actual function of the work tasks and, and, and then, you know, related to that, having a program that does align to those tasks. So how do you deal with that? Um, well, you can ask the worker. Yep. You can ask for job descriptions and yep. um, get that kind of information. What if, you, if that's not your area of expertise, if you like? Well, you need to get somebody that is their area of expertise, I would say. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in Australia, vocational rehab providers are a great resource in, in that regard. <laughs> yeah. And conversations with people and employers or other yep. people in the workplace can be important, or as you say, other external um, work experts can be helpful around that as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, just the other thing around this is, yeah, good work is good for your health. Um, there is a real push to get people back to work as soon as possible because of what you've just said. But, you know, there are some cases where a little rest and time off work is probably necessary. Yep. Um, you've talked about that guy with the swollen yes. knee. Yeah. That's a, probably a good example <laughs> of that, is. isn't it? Where there's an in instance where there's clear specific pathology and relative rest is important for that. Mm. And, you know, even prolonged sitting in some of those is unhelpful. Yeah. But I think setting time frames around that and yep. reviewing that is important with clear communication. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it could have been a different story for that fellow, I think. Um, yeah. Now looking at his second surgery and, and no better, you know, nine months later, whereas if they just had a, given it a bit of time, it, it might have gone a different way. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, so job demands, we've kind of touched on that there. Um, workplace processes... Anything on that? I think you wrote that one down and you should expand on that. Yeah, I think I cut and pasted it from your um, framework um, PowerPoint, Tim. <laughs> um, but it, I, I guess it is important to know, um, it, it's kind of around, it touches on the other issues around are they, what available support do they have in the workplace as you're getting, getting them back. So, um, you know, is there an injury management advisor in the company that's yeah. responsible for that? Or are you dealing directly with a, with a direct manager? Um, so, yeah, and I guess also more broadly understanding the processes of the system that you work in. So in Australia, for instance, you know, there's so many, there's, a, there's five or six, 
maybe seven different workers' compensation legislations, mm -hmm. and they are actually quite different in yeah. some regards. Yeah. And whereas the skills as a therapist in those might be the same, there are things particular to each of them around reporting and communication um, that you need to understand. Yeah. And um, that actually reminds me of, um, you know, we, we do speak to a lot of people that work in this system that don't like communicating or don't do it very well. And I like your line around this of like, well, when you've accepted to see this patient under a compensation framework, you've taken on the responsibility to communicate effectively. Yeah, and, and speaking of framework, certainly in Australia, there's the um, framework for delivery of health services yep. that is endorsed by all workers' compensation bodies that list those things, and one of those is communicating. Yes. You know, one of the key tenets of that. Yes. And that comes down to that next point of having a compensation claim Obviously you can have people with pain related to work that might be a private patient that we would consider different workplace factors, but the majority of these often have a compensation claim. And as you're saying, mm. because of that, you're working within that context as, we, as we've talked about um, previously. So if you're a health practitioner, you need to have an understanding of that. Yeah. Because it is different compared to say a private patient. It is. And if that's not your area of strength as we always say put up your hand or refer on or yeah. um, get co-care in place with someone else that can assist with that because mm. many times lack of understanding of the context of the system you're working in yeah. has a negative impact on the outcome for the person with the problem yeah it does yeah. it does and the claim acceptance is um, is written next and yeah. um, you know, we, we do see the odd people where that's delayed and it's, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> um, and legal issues, so I think it's probably well known that um, the, uh, having a legal case is a negative outcome predictor. Yeah, it's the strongest predictor <laughs> of poor outcome overall, poor outcome from surgery, poor yeah. outcome from return to work and function. Mm -hmm. So although legal support at times is extremely important, mm -hmm. it's another complicating layer yes. in the process. And we often say to people if they're specifically pursuing financial recompense for their injury, by definition it's very hard to get better while you're in the process of proving how disabled you are. Yeah. And that's not a reflection on that person. No, it's just the way it is. That's the circumstance of it. And yeah. people will often acknowledge, yes, that's the case, and they're almost at times better place to finalise that process and then be in a position to move forward with whatever management is, yeah. is helpful for them. Yeah, good. I don't think there's any more points under that um, box that we can't read for. Hopefully there isn't, but I can't think of any other work things particularly. Can you? Um, the things that we haven't specifically mentioned there, which are more the extrinsic factors, is around ergonomic assessment, Yeah. for example, which yeah. will be relevant to private patients that don't have a workers' compensation claim and say my problem comes on when I'm doing heaps of stuff at the desk or a certain mm. physical task. So that's where, as physiotherapists, we're often very skilled at assessing those individual components and we'll talk about that in the later session of functional behaviours, but at times it is highly important to be able to possibly visit the workplace and do a specific ergonomic assessment around that, um, or at least gain more information of understanding the work duties and the workplace mm -hmm. setup. That said, we need to be clear with getting the story off the person. Yeah. People often identify a problem at work, and traditionally in our training we go, right, what is your workplace setup? Is there an issue there? We need to hear the story. There's a clear link between that before we go too far down that line at times, I would say, from yeah. my experience. Yeah. And that just made me think of just the broader changes in work that are occurring in the world. So, you know, we, we, in Australia, we're kind of the back end, hopefully, of, of the COVID situation, but more people are working from home because of that. But in general, um, changes in workforce um, in terms of much more people in, I forget the abbreviation, but in jobs like Uber or yeah. where, they're, where they're not actually necessarily employed yeah. um, as a traditional employer. Um, other changes in workforce um, in terms of robotics and 
job displacement related to that. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on more globally mm. in, in yep. um, the work field that's going to change, um, change this over time. Mm. Yep. All right, great. So, oh yeah, I did, I did have a reference here. Um, was involved in this paper a few years ago, uh, looking at models of care, particularly related to um, work, m managing work-related musculoskeletal pain. Um, so just putting that up there as a, as a bit of a um, um, prompt for people to go look for that if, if, they, if they want some more information. Yeah, it's a, it's a beast of a paper I, I <laughs> use if I'm needing to get a good sleep, you can get yeah. into some of that. But no, but if you do have that as a good reference there, there's been some other, well, the authors on that are a broad mix of, of different healthcare professionals with different levels of expertise around pain and work. Yeah. So I'll talk this up perhaps a bit more than you would. Yeah. Um, and do you want to comment quickly on the overarching principles and then the three different levels? Yeah, there? sure, okay. Well, there are overarching principles and number one we've already spoken about is that good work is good for your health. Yeah. Um, in, 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 I only learned that it should be good work like a little while after this was published. So it just says work is good for your health, but it, it really is good work is good for your health. And the other one is a, a modern understanding of the biology of pain, which yeah. um, you know we'll talk about in, in what we've already spoken about, haven't we? Yeah. In the in the pain um, element of this framework, um, but so there are, there are overarching principles. Uh, yeah, this real mix of as a healthcare practitioner, we're really used to working at the individual level. It can be harder to understand um, where that fits in terms of an organisational level and then at a systems-based level, but it touches on all the things we've just spoken about yeah. around the employer and then the system they're working within. Um, so the organisation level is at the employer level or the, yep. the job part of it, so yeah. you're not just dealing with the person as you, we've talked about in the last slide. Yeah. And then what's the system bit? Uh, the legal kind of framework, the compensation framework, the policies and procedures that override that yep. yeah um, so yeah that it, it is a, a really good microcosm and it's the same for all musculoskeletal pain really that you know you're working in these different levels of system that do have an influence <laughs> yeah and I can certainly think of examples because we see a mix of work-related pain and non-work-related pain in our clinical practice and the person bits the same but my communication will vary quite a lot mm. because of what we now have is a quite a solid understanding of the system or as you say the, the the system level factors that will contribute so we can be more conversant across that and I think we've got better over time at being conversant with the other stakeholders and understanding their roles mm. which this paper highlights a little bit as well yeah. to allow you to you know, all the treatments might be in place, as we've said, but there's other things that are, are barriers to this. Yeah. And that's where, if you don't have that expertise, getting more input, because you might be doing everything right, but the person's not getting better. Yeah. So again, that's that on referral or co-care at times, as we often mm. talk about. Yeah, and then the communication is as important as the squat exercises. Exactly. Mm. All right, good. So, uh, musculoskeletalframework.net is where you'll find the, the framework, the ebook, the app, and other marvelous bits of information. Um, I don't have anything else to say, do you? No, I'm done, Darren. This is Darren signing off. Tim's going to stay. I'm staying. Okay, you stay there, Tim. I'll okay. go.